But the principle is, and this is going to be useful to us in the tafsir of this surah, that Allah Azza wa Jal la yuqsinu illa bi mu'azzam. Allah only swears by that which is significant in his sight. الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا وهو العزيز الغفور. So we begin with the tafsir of Surah Al Qiyamah. Ibn Kathir رحمه الله تعالى he said وهي مكية. This surah is from the surah. That were revealed to the Prophet ﷺ in the time in which the Prophet ﷺ was in Mecca. After Allah Azza wa Jal tells us, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, La uqsimu bi yawm al qiyamah, wa la uqsimu bi nafs al lawama. In the beginning, Ibn Kathir, he discusses the oath which Allah Azza wa Jal swears. And we know that as for us, we're only allowed to swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're not allowed to swear by anything else. So we say, Wallahi. We say, Wallahi nafsi biyadi. And the likes of that, you swear by Allah, I swear by the one who's hand my soul is in, and the likes of that. وَرَبِّ الْكَعْبَةِ I swear by the Lord of the Kaaba, and so on. As for Allah Azza wa Jal, then Allah swears by whatever He wills from His creation. But the principle is, and this is going to be useful to us in the tafsir of this surah, that Allah Azza wa Jal لَا يُقْسِنُ إِلَّا بِمُعَظَمٍ Allah only swears by that which is significant in his sight. Something which is very significant and very great in the sight of Allah. And Allah Azza wa Jal begins by swearing by Yawm Al-Qiyamah. La uqsimu bi Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And Ibn Kathir, he said, وَالْمُقْسَمُ عَلَيْهِ هَا هُنَا هُوَ إِثْبَاتُ الْمَعَادِ وَالرَّدُّ عَلَى مَا يَزْعَمُهُ الْجَهَلَةِ مِنَ الْعِبَادِ مِنْ عَدَمِ بَعْثِ الْأَجْسَادِ وَلِهَذَا قَالَ تَعَالَى لَا أُقْسِمُ بِيَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ وَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِالنَّفْسِ اللَّوَّامَةِ Here, Ibn Kathir, he says, that what Allah is swearing by here is affirming that the resurrection will take place and responding to those ignorant people who believed that Allah would not resurrect people's bodies after they died. And this is obviously one of the major themes of the surahs that were revealed in Mecca that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about Al-Ba'ath wa nushur about resurrection and about Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And we all know that this is a pillar from the pillars of Iman. And tu'mina biddahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rusuli wa bil yawm al-akhir. That you believe in the last day. And so this is one of the themes and in fact the theme of the surah all revolves around Yawm Al-Qiyamah. As for the names of Yawm Al-Qiyamah, it has many names. And some of these names we have come across already in Juz Amma, like As-Sakhah, and At-Tamimat Al-Kubara, and Ad-Din, Yawm Ad-Din, and other things uh, that we came across from the names of Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And here in Surah Al-Qiyamah, Allah Azza wa Jal describes it as Yawm Al-Qiyamah. It is the day that will most certainly happen and it is the day before which the people will stand before Allah Azza wa Jal يَوْمَ يَقُومُ النَّاسُ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ The day when the people will stand before Allah, the Lord 
of the worlds. Allah Azza wa Jal swears by Yawm al Qiyamah. And there is no doubt that Allah describes that this day is a day that is very severe. We already spoke about that. Yawman Abusan Qabtarira, a day which is long and difficult and has many terrors in it. And the Ahwad, the terrors of Yawm al Qiyamah, are many. And then Allah Azza wa Jal swears by an nafs al Nawama. Now we're going to listen to what Ibn Kathir says here and then we're going to spend quite a bit of time today talking about these two things and the connection between them. Ibn Kathir he says, وَقَالَ قَتَادًا بَلْ أَقْسَمَ بِهِمَا جَمِيعًا وَهُوَ الْمَرْوِيُّ عَنْ إِبْنِ عَبَّاسٍ وَسَعِيدِ بِنْ جُبَيْرٍ فَأَمَّا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَمَعْرُوفٍ وَأَمَّا النَّفْسُ اللَّوَّامَةِ فَقَالَ في قوله ولا أقسم بالنفس اللوامة قال تلوم على الخير والشر ونحوه عن إكرمة وقال علي بن أبي نجيح عن مجاهد تندم على ما فات وتلوم عليه We first gonna understand what Ibn Kathir said Then we're gonna go back and really try and break this issue down a little bit So we're talking about what it means when Allah swears by النفس اللوامة the soul which blames and in fact you can say frequently blames because it doesn't say la'ima but it says lawama and it's always constantly frequently blaming itself the first thing he brings is ibn abbas's statement along with saeed ibn jubair that an nafs lawama he narrates from al-hasan al-basri with regard to this ayah that he said that the believer, wallahi, we never see him except blaming himself. What did you want by this statement you made? What did you want by this thing that you ate or this thing that you talked to yourself about? As for the wicked person, they go on through life never blaming themselves. Then he mentions the statement of Sa'id ibn Jubair that the soul blames itself for good and evil. And he said similar is narrated from Ikrimah and Ali ibn Abi Najih from Mujahid who says that the soul regrets what misses it or what it missed out on and it blames itself for that. If we break this down now, we actually see that there are two opinions with regard to this soul that blames itself. There is the opinion of Al-Hasan al-Basri that this refers to the believer. And there is the opinion of Mujahid and Ikrimah that this refers to every soul. So how does it refer to the believer and how does it refer to every single soul? So if it refers to the believer, then the believer is constantly taking themselves to account. There are numerous wordings of this statement from Al-Hasan al-Basri that is narrated. For example, there is another wording in which he said, إِنَّ الْمُؤْمِنَ وَاللَّهِ مَا تَرَاهُ إِلَّا يَنُومُ نَفْسَهِ عَلَى كُلِّ حَالَاتِهِ يَسْتَقْصِرُهَا فِي كُلِّ مَا يَفْعَلْ فَيَنْدَمُ وَيَلُومُ نَفْسَهِ وَإِنَّ الْفَاجِرَ لَيَمْضِي قُدُمًا لَا يُعَاتِبُ نَفْسَهِ he says the believer, wallahi, blames himself in everything he does. And everything he does, he makes it that he's flawed and he looks at it as flawed. His prayer, he says it wasn't good enough and his fasting, it wasn't good enough. And whatever he did, if he did sins, he blames himself. And if he good, do, did good deeds, he sees it as taqseer, yani I didn't do enough. 
As for the wicked person, the wicked person never regrets what they do. They go on through life without ever blaming, without ever blaming themselves. So according to this statement of Al-Hasan al-Basri, this ayah refers to the believer who blames themselves for their flaws. And their blaming is of two types. If it is referring to the believer, there are two types of blame. One is blaming yourself for sins. And that is clear. You see yourself that you disobeyed Allah Azza wa Jal and you see that you fell short in what you were supposed to do. You see that you fell into sins and you blame yourself for that. I came across a statement and it uh, was a statement of Ibn al-Jawzi, I think. Rahimahullah ta'ala. And it impressed me, wallahi. And what impressed me about it was that when we're speaking about the fact that our nature is to sin, right? Our nature is we sin and we fall short and we know كُلُّ بَنِي آدَمَ خَطَّى وَخَيْرُ خَطَّائِينَ التَّوَّابُ We all make mistakes. Every single son of Adam frequently makes mistakes. So if we understood that we're always making mistakes and we understood that it is necessary that we fell short in things, and if we look at ourselves and we see, yeah, I didn't do this properly and I didn't do this properly. The difference between the believer and other than the believer is that the believer is never content with what they found. The believer actually looks at that and says, yes, I know that is how Allah created me, but I'm not happy. I should have done better than that. I should have tried harder. They blame themselves in order to be better next time. And even when it comes to good deeds, as we find in the second narration from Al-Hasan al-Basri, then even when it comes to good deeds, they blame themselves. They see that it was something that was taqseer, they were, they were, it wasn't good enough. Ibn al-Qayyim, he has an amazing statement about this. From the things that Ibn al-Qayyim he said about this is he said he said the beginning of taking yourself to account is to compare the blessings of Allah with the sins that you have committed. At this time you will see a tafawut. He said You're going to see all the blessings Allah gave you and you're going to see all the sins you committed. And you know that there is nothing before you except Allah's pardon and mercy or destruction and yani being flawed. And you have nothing except al-halak wal Yani Either you're going to be destroyed and you're going to find all the flaws presented to you or Allah is going to be merciful on you and pardon you. He said, at this moment you know why your Lord is your Lord and you know why you are his servant. He said, you know that your Lord is your Lord and you know why you are his servant. He said, وَمِن ثَمَّ يَتَبَيَّنُ لَكَ حَقِيقَةَ النَّفْسِ وَصِفَاتِهَا وَأَعْظَمَةَ جَلَالِ الرُّبُوبِيَّةِ He said, at this time it becomes clear to you what your soul really is and the description of what your soul is and the greatness of Allah and his lordship becomes clear to you. And how Allah bil And how Allah is infinitely perfect and continues to bless you alone and with no partner. And that every blessing from Allah is a grace that you don't deserve, and every punishment is completely just. What I wanted to quote this, uh, this statement of Ibn al Qayyim here is I wanted, it's in Madarij al-Sa'liqin, by the way. It's in volume one, page number 170. But the thing which amazed me about the statement of Ibn al-Qayyim is that how a person looks at even their good deeds. Like Al-Hasan al-Basri said, you even see your good deeds, it's nothing in comparison to what Allah has given you. In fact, your good deeds are a ni'mah from Allah to begin with. Allah gave you your good deeds as a gift. So you don't deserve even the good deeds that you have. 
What is the purpose of all of that blaming yourself? Is it for you to become depressed? Or is it for you to understand the reality of Allah's rububiyyah? Ibn Qayyim, he says, the reason that you feel this way is that it becomes clear to you why Allah Azza wa Jal is your Lord and is deserving of all worship besides anyone else. You realize the reality of Allah's Lordship over you and the reality of your station as a servant of Allah. When you compare Allah's blessings and you, how you haven't fulfilled what Allah Azza wa Jal gave you the ability to fulfill. So here Al-Hasan Al-Basri, if we go back to his statement, he's saying that you blame yourself for everything. You're a believer. You blame yourself for your sins and you blame yourself for not doing enough with Allah's blessings. This is the first opinion. The second opinion is the opinion, as we said, of Mujahid and Ikrima. And that is the opinion that this nafs here is a general description of every nafs. And that every single soul blames itself. The nature of a human being is to blame themselves for what they missed out on. Khayran kana am Whatever it's good or bad, you blame yourself for what you missed out on. If you're a bad person, you blame yourself for the bad things you could have done, but you didn't get a chance to, to do them. And if you're a good person, you blame yourself for the, the good things that you missed out on. But here they're saying it's that Allah is swearing by the nature of the nafs. And the nature of a person's soul is that it is lawama. It is always blaming itself. This second opinion, Sheikh ibn Thaymeen, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he preferred it. That the nafs al-lawwama is not a separate description of the nafs. I mean, Allah describes three types of, of nafs in the Quran, right? The nafs al mutawainna the nafs that is tranquil and Allah is pleased with it and it is pleased with Allah. Ya ayyatuha nafs al mutawainna irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan mardiyah. And Allah describes in Surah Yusuf, وَمَا أُبَرِّئُ نَفْسِي إِنَّ النَّفْسَ لَا أَمَّارَةٌ بِالسُّوءٍ The soul is constantly commanding its owner to do evil. So according to this opinion, this opinion of Mujahid and Ikrimah here, there are two types of, of soul here. There is the soul that is pleased and the soul that is content that is mentioned in Surah Al-Fajr. And there is the evil soul that is mentioned in Surah Yusuf. And both of these souls are lawama. The evil soul blames itself for missing out on opportunities to do wrong. Or to, opportunities to enjoy itself. Opportunities for shahawat and opportunities for its desires. It missed out on those opportunities. And it's constantly blaming itself for that. And on the other hand, the nafs which is mutma'inna, the soul which is tranquil and which comes back to Allah Azza wa Jal, that soul blames itself for missing out on good. Both of these deserve to be sworn by. Because we could say that since we took the principle that Allah only swears by that which is great, then the first opinion, that is the opinion of Al-Hasan al-Basri, we can strengthen it. Because we can say that Allah here it will only swear by that which is great. And that which is great is the believer who blames themselves. Even if it is the nature of mankind, to, everybody blames themselves. But the believer is the one that has the status because of it. And this is the link between the two ayat. لا أقسم بيوم القيامة ولا أقسم بالنفس اللوام. And that statement, and that link, you can find it in the statement of Umar ibn al-Khattab in some of his writings that he wrote to and he some, and he, in a letter he said حَاسِبْ نَفْسَكَ فِي الرَّخَاءِ قَبْلَ حِسَابِ الشِّدَّةِ فَإِنَّ مَنْ حَاسَبَ نَفْسَهُ فِي الرَّخَاءِ قَبْلَ حِسَابِ الشِّدَّةِ عَادَ أَمْرُهُ إِلَى الرِّضَى وَالْغِبَّةِ وَمَنْ أَلْهَتْهُ حَيَاتُهُ وَشَغَالَتْهُ أَهْوَاءُ 
عاد أمره إلى الندامة والخسار. He said, take yourself to account in times of ease before the difficult accounting takes place. For whoever takes themselves to account at times of ease before difficult, the difficult account takes place, they will return in a state of pleasure and happiness. And whoever becomes busy with their life and preoccupied with their desires, they are going to suffer regret and loss. Their end result will be regret and loss. So here to survive the account of Yawm al Qiyamah, you have to be the praiseworthy soul that blames itself. You have to be the one that Al-Hasan al-Basri talks about. That you don't see a believer except he's always blaming himself. If you behave like that and you become a nafs al in a praiseworthy sense, then the hisab yawm al-qiyamah will be easy for you. And that appears to be the link between these ayat. Because in order to be from those people who are saved Yawm al Qiyamah, you have to be from those people who take yourself to account and blame yourself for every missed opportunity and every good deed that is not done in the right way and so on. You have to blame yourself for those things. And we also, in any case, have to realize the reality of our nafs. And part of, in fact, a major part of correcting your nafs, like we spoke about in the class, we have our class on a Saturday. We spoke about a major, major part of correcting your nafs and tazkiyat to nafs is knowing your nafs to begin with. Knowing what is for it and what is against it. And that's why when Ibn al-Qayyim, he came to the ayah, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu attaqu allaha wal tanzur nafsul ma qaddamat li ghad. He said, The reality of this ayah is knowing what your soul has done that is good or that is, that is for it and what has your soul done that will be held against it. So when you know the nature of your soul, this is also from the things that allows a person to be successful Yawm al -qiyam, to know the nature of your soul and yourself. Even if it is just knowing the bad nafs lawama, the bad soul that blames itself. Because if you know that your habit as a soul is to crave for things and to desire things that are not good for you, and many times you crave over things that missed you that were never good for you to begin with, and you blame yourself for missing out on things that were never good for you to begin with, when you realize this, it becomes easier to prevent yourself from falling into those things in the first place. And you become like those people that Allah said, As for the one who fears, we said the maqam is what? We said two things, right? The maqam is standing in front of Allah. Yawm al-qiyamah. When you fear the qiyam, the standing in front of Allah Azza wa Jal. And the maqam, yani you fear the status of Allah. The maqam is the status also. Yani you fear Allah's names and attributes. You fear that Allah is shadeed al-adab, sari al-hisab, dhuntiqab. These names and attributes that are told that Allah is severe in punishment and quick to take to account. And that Allah is, is severe in retribution. These things, they make you scared of Allah. And that is also from the things which makes a person successful. Yawm al-Qiyamah. And that's why it has been said, many, it's narrated similar things from many of the great Imams of Islam. That they said, مَا عُبِدَ اللَّهُ بِمِثْلَ الْخَوْفِ Nobody ever worshipped Allah with anything as good as fear. So the thing is that when you know the reality of your nafs, you realize the reality of Fear what it is to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like Ibn al-Qayyim said, when you compare the blessings Allah has given you and you compare how your nafs has taken those blessings, you realize that Allah is your true Lord and you are truly his slave and that whatever he does to you will be just. And that comes from what? Knowing Allah's names and attributes and knowing the state of yourself. As for a person who falls short in those two things, 
they make the hisab difficult for themselves. They make the qiyamah and standing before Allah Azza wa Jal and the hisab, they make it a difficult hisab. We spoke about this in Surah Al-Mutaffifin. The hisab, which is hisab and yasira, an easy hisab, the presentation of the deeds, without being asked about every individual issue. So when a person knows Allah's names and attributes, they fear the maqam of Allah. They fear Allah's status, and they fear standing in front of Allah Azza wa And then when a person knows their, themselves and what they have done, and how short they have fallen as it relates to Allah's rights. They fear Allah more and they try harder and they turn back to Allah more and they ask Allah's forgiveness. If somebody doesn't know Allah's names and attributes and they see the state of themselves, what might they happen? They fall into despair. They say, I'm not gonna be forgiven because I am a person who has just done everything wrong. I don't see any hope for myself. And as for the person who doesn't know themselves, then this person may find themselves preoccupied with hope. They have too much hope. Because they say, Allah is kareem and ghafoor and rahim and, you know, I'm not that bad. But the one who knows Allah's names and attributes and knows themselves and blames themselves for how much they have fallen short with the rights of Allah, that person should be in a state of fear. And that means their ibadah should be better and they should turn back to Allah and they should be stronger in taking themselves to account. And there are all kinds of statements like this. There are all kinds of statements and from particularly Al-Hasan Al-Basri and others. They had statements like this. If a person is not harsh upon themselves, and if a person is not harsh upon themselves now, they will find al qiyamah to be harsh and hard upon them. And it's narrated, for example, that Al Hassan al Basri, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, Al Mu'minu qawwamun ala nafsihi yuhasibuha lillah. Wa inna ma khaffa al hisabu ala qawmin hasabu anfusahum fi dunya. Wa inna ma shakka al hisabu yawm al qiyamah ala qawmin akhadu hadha al amra. He said, the people that the account is made easy for are those people who were harsh on themselves in accounting for themselves in this dunya. But the people who never took themselves to account in this dunya or they were easy on themselves, they just let it go. Those people, their account will be hard in the akhir. And that means that there has to be one time your account is hard. If you wish, you make it hard for yourself now, so it will be easy for yourself then. Or you make it easy for yourself now, and the fear is that it will be hard for you, it will be hard for you then. So all of these are within what we've been talking about in this ayah. And you can find these statements mentioned in two places. You can find them mentioned in the ayah. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَالْتَنظُرْ نَفْسٌ مَا قَدَّمَتْ لِغَدْ And you can find them in this ayah here, the tafsir of so we took from this the connection between an nafs al lawama and yawm al qiyam. There is another connection which we can add to that. And that is that the nafs will blame itself for what it lost out on in the dunya yawm al qiyam. So on the day of resurrection, when the person sees what it was that has passed and they see what they have put forward for that day, the person will regret. And the greatest of those in regret will be the disbeliever who will say, Ya laytani kuntu turaba. I wish that I could have been dust. And they will regret all the things that passed in this dunya. Except those people that Allah Azza wa Jal, He said, La khawfun alayhim wa la yahzan. There is no fear on them for what passed and they will not grieve over what will come. So there is another connection here which is that Yawm al Qiyamah the soul will feel regret. Even the soul, I mean, the righteous soul, would wish that it could be returned to the dunya again so that it could do even more righteous deeds. Not a, not a regret of, of any terror, not a regret of feeling that I lost my life or I wasted my life, but just a feeling that 
You wanted to do as much as you could have done. And you wanted to have even increased upon the good that you did. And so this is another type of the blaming that the soul will have. And this is for both the believing soul and the wicked soul. Both of them will blame themselves to a certain extent, as we've mentioned in some of the evidences, Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Then Ibn Kathir, he says, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, وَقَوْلُهُ تَعَالَىٰ أَيَحْسَبُ الْإِنسَانُ أَنَّ النَّجْمَ عِظَامَةً أَيْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةً أَيَظُنُّ أَنَّ لَا نَقْدِرُ عَلَىٰ إِعَادَةِ عِظَامِهِ وَجَمْعِهَا He said, the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, أَيَحْسَبُ الْإِنسَانُ أَنَّ النَّجْمَ عِظَامَةً Does mankind believe that we will not gather together his bones, meaning Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Does he think that Allah Azza wa Jal is not able to bring him back, his body back, from what it has become, and to gather it together min from all the different places that it was in? This question is a rhetorical question because Allah answers the question. بَلَا قَادِرِينَ عَلَىٰ صَوِّيَ بَنَانَ Rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to bring this body back and he even and he Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can bring it back as he says here he said بَلَا سَنَجْمَعُهَا Indeed, rather, we will gather it together. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His ability to bring it together. And as we know, this, yani, this is mentioned here. And yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, many, many times, He proves to us His ability to bring, to resurrect people from nothing. And if you look at the ayat of the Qur'an here, there are many, many ayat in which Allah Azza wa Jal talks to us or tells us and gives us proof about the resurrection of mankind from bones. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and even the banan, even the tips of the fingers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring and resurrect a person even to the tips of their fingers. And from the things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in this, Allah tells us to look at the dead land. How Allah Azza wa Jal brings it back to life. And Allah Azza wa Jal tells us to look at how He created mankind the first time. And how He will resurrect them again after He created them. After He created them the first time. Ibn Kathir, he says here, بَلَا سَنَجْمَعُهَا قَادِرِينَ على أن نسوي بنان أي قدرتنا صالحة لجمعها ولو شئنا لبعثناه أزيد مما كان فنجعل بنانه أي أطراف عصابعه مستوية He says here Allah عز وجل if he wills he can even bring a person back more complete than they were before then he says, بَلْ يُرِيدُ الْإِنسَانُ لِيَفْجُرَ أَمَامَهُ يَعْنِي الْأَمَلْ يَقُولُ الْإِنسَانُ أَعْمَلُ ثُمَّ أَتُو قَبْلَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Rather, mankind has this kind of infinite hope. They say, I will do these deeds and then I will repent. I'm going to do these deeds that I'm doing and I'm going to repent before يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ I'm going to repent before Yawm al -Qiyana. And so he continues doing what he's doing, believing that he's going to repent in the future. He says, وَيُقَالُ هُوَ الْكُفْرِ بِالْحَقِّ بَيْنَ يَدَيْ السَّاعَةِ قَالَ سَعِيدٌ عَنْ إِبْنِ عَبَّاسٍ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمَا يَعْنِي يَمْضِي قُدُمَا وَقَالَ مُجَاهِدْ لِيَفْجُرَ أَمَامَهُ لِيَمْضِيَ أَمَامَهُ رَاكِبًا رَأْسَهُ 
وقال علي بن أبي طلحة عن ابن عباس هو الكافر يكذب في يوم الحساب وكذا قال ابن زيد ولهذا قال بعده يسأل أيان يوم القيامة So they differ after that This person who says I'm going to do these deeds and then I will repent Does this include the believer or is this referring to the disbeliever? And the disbeliever who continues in a state of disbelief and says that I have nothing to worry about. And I'm going to live for a very long time and I'm not convinced even when I die that Allah will resurrect me. Is this the one being spoken about? The person who disbelieves in Allah Azza wa Jal before the hour comes and carries on with their life like this. Or is it the person who يعني, commits sins and says that I will repent before Yawm al Qiyamah and in the general sense? From the evidences they brought is the next ayah. Yes, Alu Ayyana Yawm al Qiyam. He asks, When will the day? Mata Yakunu Yawm al Qiyam. When will the Yawm al Qiyamah be? Wa inna ma su'aluhu su'al ustib'ad. And the person is asking this question not genuinely. And that's why the questions of the disbelievers in the Qur'an in general are not genuine questions. And they didn't come to the Prophet ﷺ and ask, when is the hour in a real genuine sense? Tell us when is the hour. But instead what they did is they asked this question in order to say that it will not happen. And he tell us when will this day be, meaning this day will never come. Meaning that this day will never come. And they don't really believe that it's actually going to happen. Rather they deny that it's going to happen. They say, when will this promise be if you are really truthful? And that's why even the question that the disbelievers asked to the prophets, it's not a genuine question. Many times, whether it's Quraysh or whether it's the people from the previous prophets, when they ask these questions, they are not genuine questions. When they said, وَمَا Rahman, Who is our Rahman? It's not a genuine question. They don't really want to know the answer. But rather they say this in order to reject it. And so they say, when is this promise if you are really truthful? Meaning we don't believe, we don't believe that this promise is going to come true and we don't accept that it's going to come true. And so they have this infinite hope. This issue of hope, Ibn Qayyim, he mentions it, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. He says, if you look at the Sahaba, radiallahu anhu, what you see about the Sahaba is you see that they were fi ghayatil aman, fi ghayatil aman ma ghayatil khawf. He said they were in a state of doing so many good deeds and they were also in a state of being extremely scared. As for us, Ibn al-Qayyim says, and he's talking about his time, so how about our time? Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, as for us, we bring two things together. Jama'na bayna ghayat al-amal wa taqseer. Or he said, Yani al ifrat We join between having so much hope and being very, falling very, very short. Even though this is the situation of a believer, yani you could be in this situation that when you went far away from guidance and your iman goes down, one of the things you find people doing is they have lots of hope and very little actions. Whereas the Sahaba had lots of actions and lots of fear. But this same statement was mentioned with regard to the Munafiq. That the Munafiq is even worse than that. The Munafiq is in a state where they have complete hope, not in Allah, but complete hope in what they are doing. That what they are doing is never going to, there's never going to anything go wrong with it. And they're never going to be caught, they're never going to be found out, their plot is not going to be exposed, nothing is going to happen to them, neither in this world or in the next. You see the kind of 
extreme hope that they have. Likewise, you can say this about this ayah here. بَلْ يُرِيدُ الْإِنسَانِ لِيَفْجُرَ أَمَانِ That if it refers to the believer, or if the believer is included, then what we see is this is the example of the person who does many sins and says, tomorrow I will repent. After Hajj I will repent. Next year I will repent. When I'm older I will repent. And they say they're going to change. And if it refers to the disbeliever, the hope of the disbeliever is not hope in the mercy of Allah. It's hope in the sense of not ever believing that the things that Allah says are going to happen. That's what is meant by Al-Amal here. It's the hope that they will never be resurrected, that nothing will ever happen to them, that they will never be punished, that Allah will not give victory to his messenger and to the believers. This is the kind of extreme hope they have. So it's not a hope in the mercy of Allah. That's what I wanted to make clear here. That's what also, and you can take from the statement of Ibn Kathir. It's not a hope in the mercy of Allah. It's a hope in the sense that they will never, any their plot and their plan will never fall apart and that they will never have any consequences for what they're doing. And this is a kind of carelessness because they're just going through their life day by day without ever believing that anything will be taken to account. Here at this point, I wanted to raise an, uh, any, something that we had spoken about in the tafsir of Juz'an. And we spoke about it in, in Surat al Ma'un. What is the nature of a person who doesn't believe in Yawm al Qiyamah? Like Allah describes to us the nature of the person who doesn't believe they're going to be resurrected. What happens to them? That person, And the person who this is their situation. Many times Allah describes to us in Juz Amma, Juz Tabarak, about the circumstances of the person who doesn't believe in Yawm al What's the end result? They don't fear Allah Azza wa Jal. They don't care how they behave towards others in this life because they have nothing to be scared of. They have nothing to fear. They, they live in comp a complete sense of and in false tranquility. That nothing bad will ever happen to them and Allah will not take them to account for what he says or for what they say and what they do. And this is mentioned in many ayats. So when it comes, it's worth to think about the circumstance of the person and the situation of the person who doesn't believe in the qiyamah. What will that person do? And one of the things that Allah says, بَلْ يُرِيدُ الْإِنسَانُ لِيَفْجُرَ أَمَامَهُ يَسْأَلُ أَيَّانَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ and this person goes through their life never believing that they will have any consequences for the things that they have done. And that also is worth mentioning, is one of the greatest of the punishments of Allah in this world. If you look at all of the punishments that Allah speaks about in this world, the worst of them is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives that person a false sense of peace and security. And maybe we can call this istidraj. And he, they are snuck up upon them. And he, like they thought that their life, everything is perfect. And it's mentioned in many, many ayat of the Quran. Allah mentions those people when they forgot what Allah reminded them of. When they forgot the remembrance of Allah. Allah didn't send upon them a flood. Allah didn't send upon them a, a scream that caused them to die. Allah didn't send upon them stones from the sky, Allah opened them the doors of the dunya. 
every single thing they wanted, they got it. Until they became happy with what they had in this life. And they never thought about Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Allah took their lives suddenly and they were cut off from every chance to escape. This can be said to be the worst of the punishments that happens to a person in this life. That Allah Azza wa Jal opens up this dunya to them to an extent that they forget completely about the Akhirah. And you can take this, you can link this also to this ayah. بَلْ يُرِيدُ الْإِنسَانُ The believer is constantly reminding themselves of Yawm Al-Qiyam and what will happen. And constantly reminding themselves of the temporary nature of this world and constantly reminding themselves that of whatever good, that whatever good comes to them in this world is not an indicator of whether Allah loves you or whether Allah doesn't love you. In the famous statement that Allah gives this world to those that He loves and He gives it to those that He doesn't love. So having a lot in this world is not a sign that Allah loves you and it's not a sign that Allah doesn't love you. It neither means good nor it means bad. But the difference is that the person who doesn't believe in Al-Qiyamah, when they are given in this world, it distracts them away from the Akhirah and they don't come back to Allah Azza wa Jalla. And Allah takes their souls while they are disbelievers because they forgot about Allah after Allah gave them what they thought was their paradise in this world. As for the believer, they are a nafs al the person who is blaming themselves all the time. And they're blaming themselves even when it relates to the worldly life. There is a statement of... Uh, See, did we run out of time? Or we have to. There's a statement of uh, Ibn al Jawzi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, where he talks about this about a person taking themselves to account and blaming themselves even for the things that are permissible, even the mubahat, even the matters of this world, like the general life in this world. Why did you do this? Did you even need it? And you might even start off thinking you needed it and you wanted it. And then by the end, you're saying that I'm not going to go back to that again. A person is living a life where they are even questioning the permissible things that Allah gave them in this world and blaming themselves. Did you really need it? Did it really bring you nearer to Allah? Did it take you further away? What was the point of it or the benefit of it? And a person might even start off thinking that what I did was good. But after they keep on blaming themselves and taking themselves to account, by the end, they actually realized that what they were doing from the mubahat, the things which are halal, it wasn't good for them. It was taking them away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As for the person who doesn't believe in the qiyamah, this person doesn't ask these questions. Rather, they continue on in their life in a complete sense of security that nothing bad is ever going to happen to them. And in fact, even more than that, they start to ridicule the Qiyamah and say Ayyana Yawmul Qiyamah When is the Qiyamah going to come? You know you people here all sat worried about something It's very very far away And if it happens I don't even think I And mean, who is going to bring us back to life After we were dust? Who is going to bring back our bones After they were all separated? Yes They ask when is the hour going to come? And like Ibn Kathir says, this question is not genuine. It is a question to see that they don't believe it's going to happen and they don't believe that or they believe that it's something that is extremely unlikely or they deny it completely. There's one more point that I want to mention before we take some questions, inshallah. I've mentioned it before, but I just wanted to uh, emphasize it one more time, which is this issue of the word insan. The word insan. Some of the scholars, they said that the word insan in the surah, which are makiyah, that, these, that this time it, it comes with the meaning of the kafir, really the disbelief. And we spoke about this in Juz'an. And others, they said that it's more general than that. And it can be read as the disbeliever. Then there's a certain situation that applies to the disbeliever. But there are also elements in it which are generic to every person. And we spoke about this in 
juzu amma and said that there are times and it's not necessary that every time the word insan comes that it should mean al kafir rather there are times when it clearly refers to the belief of the disbelievers but there are other times when and it's not exclusive to the disbeliever like we said here bal yuridu al insan li yafjura amama no doubt this applies to the disbeliever first of all before everybody else but everyone could be guilty of that to a certain extent yani having too much hope and not thinking about the consequences of of their actions and this can be a situation of mankind in general so we wanted to just remind you or to highlight that point i think that's okay for us to stop there inshallah ta'ala I wanted to take quite a long time on these first few ayat and after that inshallah ta'ala I think inshallah we should be able to finish the surah in the next few lessons and plus I haven't had a chance to speak to you guys for a long time so if there are any questions if I can answer them I will answer them and if I don't know the answer I'm going to tell you I don't know the answer Sound. He says so we will definitely be continuing at some point but probably not immediately after Ramadan so most likely we will have like a break I think the tasrih the permission for the class finishes at Ramadan we'll apply for it again according to when we're going to be back together again I'm not sure it might be towards the middle of the year or something like that inshallah according to what Allah makes easy subhanallah when we started this course our goal was to do we, we had this conversation that we were going to do just Amma, just Tabarak in like 12 weeks. And some of the teachers, because it was given to many teachers, if you remember, there were many different teachers. Some of them finished and some of them didn't. But uh, we're still a long way from finishing. So we hope to finish it, inshallah ta'ala. Bismillah ta'ala. Yes. The difference between, I'll just answer in English for the benefit of everyone, inshallah. What is the difference between a nafs and we spoke about this in the Saturday class generally speaking for the purpose of tazkiyah to nafs there's no difference in the topic of tazkiyah to nafs there's no difference but Al-Ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala in Ahiyya Ulum al -Din, he mentions that it depends what you mean about the word nafs he actually mentions four words he mentions an nafs wa ruh wal qalb wal aqr the nafs, the self, the soul, the heart, and the mind. And all of these have different meanings according to what you're speaking about. So you could use the word nafs to mean a whole, like the whole person. The whole person. Uh, for example, for example, when uh, Umar in the hadith, that none of you truly believe until you love me, i.e. the Prophet ﷺ, more than your parents and your children and all of mankind. When Umar, he said, I love you more than nafsi, myself, my nafs. Here, the nafs is a general way of referring to yourself, right? Your whole self. But in the topic of tazkiyah to nafs, like Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala said, is that a nafs and a ruh, they mean the same thing in the topic of tazkiyah to nafs, specifically. And if you refer to that statement, in, you can find it in Ihiya Ulum al deen even though I'm not recommending you to read Ihiya Ulum al deen from beginning to end, but there are some benefits. There is a statement where Al-Ghazali breaks down, it's, you can find it easily on Google, where he breaks down the meaning of al-qalb, wal-aql, wal-ruh, wal-nafs, the basic summary is that it depends what you're talking about. Because if you are talking about the what he calls al-latifa al-rabbaniyya, and you're talking about a hidden element, which is something that is only known to Allah Azza wa Jal, this is the ruh and this is the nafs that we are talking about here. But when you use the words, you can use them in other senses. For example, the ruh. A doctor can use it as in, is somebody alive or dead? Al-Ghazali mentions it. For the ruh in the sense of, does somebody 
has his soul left him or not? Any? Is he living or is he, is he dead? But that's not what concerns us in Tezkiyat and nafs What concerns us is the spiritual soul, which is the ruh, which is the nafs, which is another meaning of al-qalb as well, the heart. And I explained it in a lot of detail in the AMU. Al-Madkhal ila Tezkiyat and nafs with AMU. We did it in a lot of a lot of detail there. But the court is beneficial. There's a lot of benefits in it. And Allah is the best. Excellent. I will try my best to answer. So the first thing we need to understand about Tahiyyat al-Masjid is that Tahiyyat al-Masjid is not a Salah in of itself. It's not a Salah in of itself. It is simply the command of the Prophet ﷺ Pray to Raka of anything. Nafila. Whatever is easy for you Just pray something before you sit down That's the meaning of Tahiyyat al-Masjid So it isn't a prayer in itself For example, you don't make it up Like if you prayed Dhuhr You came and you started praying Dhuhr You don't make up Tahiyyat al-Masjid afterwards Because it's not a prayer in itself It's just the command Don't sit down till you pray Two raka'at Yes, you can pray it nafila As a recommended prayer just by itself, like as a, as a voluntary prayer by itself. Or you can pray it as part of dhuhr or as part of the ratiba or as part of something else, yani whatever you came to the masjid for. The next question is, what is the ruling of Tahiyyat al-Masjid? Sunnah mu'akkada, that's what the majority they said should hold. They said it's a highly, highly recommended sunnah. And some of them said, yani, were it not for that statement, we would have said that it's wajib. But we're going to say that it's any extremely, extremely highly recommended, any as close to wajib as you can get. That's what it seems to be the ruling. That's what the majority said. And very few of the scholars said that it's wajib in of itself. But most of them said that it is any sunnah mu'akkada. It's a highly recommended sunnah. And Allah is our general's best. I think that's a good place for us to stop to give people time to go and make wudu if they need. Uh, and inshallah, I don't believe uh, we don't have Sheikh Abdul Rahman with us today. Uh, he's away. So inshallah ta'ala, this will be the, the last class here today, inshallah. But I'll be here next week, bi'idhni lai ta'ala. That's what Allah is made easy for me to mention. Tomorrow, the class will be on in Silicon Oasis in the Masjid Sheikh Ali after Isha on the topic of Tazkiyat and nafs that we're talking about, al istibfar That's what Allah made easy for me to mention. Allah knows best. Wassalatu wassalam. Ala namina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma.